and I kind of renamed it Lyomyomas versus Lyomyosarcomas. And we all know that the T2-weighted sequence is the workhorse for imaging the uterus. And on your left, a typical normal uterus on the T2-weighted uh, image. In the middle is a patient who has a pretty garden variety fibroid. And on your right is a patient who has a, a florid lyomyosarcoma, basically effacing all normal uterine anatomy. And I was going to try to use the audience response system, but that wasn't working consistently, so we're just going to sort of do it for ourselves. Two patients, two different patients, and I want you to look at the dominant lesion in each uterus and decide whether one's a fibroid or one's a lyomyosarcoma. And I think we would all agree that the one on your left is a normal fibroid, on the, on the one on the right is more worrisome, and that's a sarcoma. So that's the first case. Second case is kind of similar, right? Two different patients, two different dominant lesions, the one on the left and the one on the right, and I think we'd all agree again, the one on the left is a fibroid, a lyomyoma, the one on the right is more worrisome, perhaps a sarcoma. Last case. Two different patients, two dominant lesions. We have to make a decision about them, which one is the lyomyoma, which one is the lyomyosarcoma. And you might be tempted to say the one on the left, again, is the fibroid, and then the one on the right is the sarcoma, but you'd be wrong. In fact, the one on the left is a sarcoma, and the one on the right is a degenerated fibroid. And therein lies the rub that it's often incredibly difficult to distinguish a degenerated fibroid from a sarcoma, and distinguishing the two can truly be challenging. And this is more than just a theoretical construct because in April of this year, the FDA issued a safety warning on laparoscopic power morselators, or LPMs, for patients undergoing hysterectomy and myomectomy. And a laparoscopic power morselator is basically a handheld blender that gets inserted into the patient's body and it whooshes up tissue and then they extract these bits and pieces of tissue. The bad part is, is that you leave some tissue behind. And what concerned the FDA was that they were concerned about upstaging of unknown sarcomas. And the FDA issued new uh, statistics about the, un the prevalence of unsuspected uterine sarcomas and the prevalence of unsuspected uterine lyomyosarcomas in women undergoing these procedures, anywhere from one in 352 patients to one in almost 500 patients, which is a very different prevalence than many gynecologi gynecologists had uh, cited to date. So much so that in July of this year, the FDA held a con uh, an OBGYN devices panel uh, meeting. And I would say that at that meeting, there was data presented unpublished that the prevalence wasn't one in 352 or one in about 500, but one in 7,000. But again, this is unpublished data. And you can see that this is very prescient. It's, it's in the papers. I mean, this is from the Wall Street Journal at the time of that uh, devices panel. And following the devices panel, the Ethicon, which is a subsidiary of J&J, uh, &J, voluntarily suspended sales of these devices and recalled the devices worldwide. Having said that, just last week in the Wall Street Journal, this was a headline. Gynecologists resist FDA over popular surgical tool. Doctors continue to use morselators months after regulator warned they can upstage, uh, they can spread a rather undetected cancer. So this is happening. While some of them have been removed, many women are undergoing uh, procedures that use LPMs. And they're going to look to us, the uh, gynecologists, the patients are going to look to us to help them define a better patient population to help mitigate the risk of using these laparoscopic power morselators. So how good are our different imaging modalities? Well, I think we'd agree that while ultrasound is often the first line imaging modality for women that have pelvic pain or uh, suspected fibroids, it doesn't really have the contrast or spatial resolution to always make a good determination between a good fibroid and a bad fibroid. Similarly, while we all love CT, especially in this society, it probably doesn't have the contrast resolution necessary to distinguish those two entities. PET is promising for confirming a or sarcoma and metastases and looking for recurrences, but there are known false positives. And while MRI is very promising, statistics really haven't been brought forth that have been established in a large multicenter trial. So promising, but I'm not sure we're there yet. So let's just sort of review. What's the usual garden variety, usual fibroid? Well, remember that fibroids are smooth muscle cells with intervening collagen, and that really does inform their imaging characteristics. They tend to be iso-intense to the myometrium on T1-weighted sequences. On T2, they're sort of round or oval with low signal intensity. And following contrast, 
they enhance, they're viable. Garden variety fibroid, another example of sort of usual or ULs, usual fibroids. So again, iso-intense on T1-weighted sequences, both with and without fat suppression, they don't have hemorrhage in them. On T2, they're well-defined, round or oval, and following contrast, they enhance. Now we've added to our imaging armamentarium with um, diffusion-weighted imaging and ADC maps, and a garden variety fibroid on a high B0 diffusion-weighted image on the ADC map tends to be low in signal intensity, that blackout effect. So we have, we're getting a little bit more information about our fibroids. But the degenerated fibroids are more complicated, and up to two-thirds of fibroids can have some sort of degeneration, and the degeneration is thought to be a function of them outgrowing their blood supply from a variety of etiologies. And the type of degeneration may depend upon the degree and rapidity of this vascular insufficiency. And there's lots of different kinds of degeneration that I've listed here. The most common is hyaline degeneration, but there's cystic degeneration, myxoid degeneration, red or carneous or hemorrhagic degeneration, um, sarcomatous degeneration. And then there's another subset of fibroids, not truly degenerated, but the cellular fibroids often lumped in with degenerated fibroids. And these are specific fibroids that have compact, smooth muscle with cells with very little intervening collagen. And they have a pretty specific imaging appearance. So let's see what we can do about trying to parse out what are the different imaging features. And we all like charts, and residents love charts. And even though the chart can even look helpful, in real practice sometimes it's, it's very challenging. I think we're all comfortable with sort of the usual fiber without any degeneration, the ones I just showed you. Certainly if it has cystic spaces, you'll see high signal intensity that's well circumscribed on T2 and it won't enhance. If it's myxoid degeneration, those tend to have higher signal intensities on T2-weighted sequences but are not very uh, florid in their enhancement. Some uh, fibroids that have undergone the red or carneous degeneration have very specific features, these rims of high signal intensity on T1-weighted fat suppressed technique that falls in signal on T2. The cellular fibroid, again, not a classic degenerated fibroid, but a type of fibroid, tends to have fairly high signal intensity on T2-weighted sequences, enhances really early, is well-defined, and shows restricted diffusion, and can have an elevated serum LDH. And the reason I'm including LDH in this uh, a table is that there have been some there has been some research suggesting that serum LDH is higher in patients that have leiomyosarcomas. But look at that last row. I really haven't filled it in yet because really the data is lacking. What kind of data is out there? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. First, let me show you some uh, degenerated fibroids. This is a patient who has red degeneration. On the T1-weighted fat suppressed technique, you see that high signal intensity rim. It falls in signal on T2. Following contrast, this is a hemorrhagic autoinfarcted fibroid. There is no enhancement, and there's no restricted diffusion. So that's a degenerated uh, fibroid with uh, red degeneration. Well, this is that cellular subtype of fibroid. Remember, these are compact, smooth muscle cells without little or no intervening collagen, and they tend to be brighter than your garden variety fibroids on T2-weighted sequences is the more usual type in the posterior aspect of this patient. On T1-weighted fat suppressed technique, they tend to be iso-intense, but notice they show restricted diffusion, and that makes sense given how compact these cells are with no, uh, or little or no intervening collagen. And following contrast, they enhance markedly, and that's pretty typical of a cellular fibroid. But what about this case? This is one of the ones I showed you in that test in the beginning. And if we were to describe it, I think we'd say lobulated, irregular, dare I say it almost looks like it's going through the myometrium. True, it doesn't have any bloody products that are obvious on the T1-weighted fat suppressed technique. And following contrast, some enhances, some's necrotic. It's sort of a mixed bag. And then if you look at it on the diffusion-weighted uh, image in the ADC map, there's really not classic restricted diffusion, but, you know, sitting at the PAC station, is this a good fibroid or a bad fibroid? And in, sometimes it is really challenging to know what it is. We were worried about this case. We didn't think she should go on to uterine artery embolization, and this turned out to be a degenerated fibroid with coagulative necrosis and corneous degeneration. They didn't find any sarcomatous elements. So she didn't get to preserve her uterus, but we were worried enough that maybe this was a sarcoma, um, and we chose to be a little maybe overcautious. So that gets me back to distinguishing between sarcomas and degenerated fibroids is challenging, and there really aren't any large prospective or retrospective studies that truly uh, parse this out and tease it out.
And if you look back and you do a survey in the literature of different studies that have looked at trying to look at the features of leiomyosarcomas, um, the challenge is there's probably only 60 cases that have been reported in total. And they're often grouped with other sarcomas. Every study has a different imaging protocol depending on the magnet strength, the sequences performed, whether or not contrast was given and how the contrast was given and when they acquired the images and different parameters were assessed. So it's really hard to get any uniform studies to come up with a set of true imaging characteristics. And I have some busy slides which I'm not going to go into too much detail but it will be on the website looking back from 1998 forward where I grouped the study, who the author was, how many of the sarcomas were actually leiomyosarcomas, whether or not it was retrospective or prospective, and what criteria uh, were, were used. If I can call your attention just to three uh, studies, Kornfeld in 2010 uh, did a study, and what they found that there was no objective criteria to differentiate unusual fibroids from other fibroids. And in fact, Reader Gestalt performed as well as looking at any one imaging feature. But the two most recent studies that I think we should be looking at and perhaps trying to expand upon are the Thomason Nagara study and the Sato study. And both of those not only looked at sort of the more usual features, T1 and T2, at what have you, but they also incorporated diffusion weighted imaging and ADC uh, numbers. So in the Thomas and Nagara uh, article, what they looked at were patients that had what they called a unique myometrial tumor. That is, they had only one abnormality, a dominant abnormality. And then they looked at the diffusion-weighted image, and if it had a high diffusion-weighted image signal intensity, they then looked at the T2-weighted signal intensity. And if that was intermediate to high signal intensity, they then went and looked at the ADC value. And if the ADC value was low, they found that they could correctly classify tumors in 88% of the time. That is, they correctly classified 28 of 32 tumors. However, they did have two false negatives, one of which was a recurrent leiomyosarcoma, one of which was an endometrial stromal cell sarcoma, and they also had two false positives. Most recently, Sato et al. published this uh, earlier this year, and they used 93 uterine tumors, and they divided patients based on the signal intensity, on diffusion-weighted imaging, and the ADC values. And if a patient had intermediate to high signal intensity on the diffusion-weighted image and a low ADC value less than 1.1, that made up 15 or 16.1 percent of this 93 tumors, and that was considered the high-risk group. And of those 15 patients, 10 had leiomyosarcomas. There were false positives, cellular fibroids and atypical fibroids, but again, they were able to correctly classify uh, the leiomyosarcomas using those cutoff criteria. Similarly, or alternatively rather, if the diffusion-weighted image had low signal intensity of this unique myometrial mass, uh, or if it had intermediate to high signal intensity on the diffusion-weighted image, but an ADC value greater than 1.1, they called that the low-risk group, and in that low-risk group, they had no leiomyosarcomas. There were a few true negatives of that cellular fibroid, but again, by using these cutoffs, they were able to correctly characterize uh, most lesions. So now we can try to fill out that lowest part of this uh, chart, and, and again, it's imperfect because these are small numbers in just two published studies, but we can say that fibroids tend to be irregular, uh, not round, not oval. They have hopefully some heterogeneity on the T1-weighted fat suppressed technique because of blood products. They tend to be heterogeneous on T2. Some parts enhance early, other parts are necrotic and don't enhance at all. They should have restricted diffusion and whether or not you want to believe one cutoff versus another, but it is helpful to at least have a guideline to look at the ADC values. And yes, you may see increased serum LDH. So this is just a typical feature of a typical leiomyosarcoma, again, showing most of those imaging characteristics. This was before we were using uh, diffusion-weighted imaging and ADC maps routinely. This is an image from the paper, from the Thomas and Nagara paper, showing the heterogeneity on T2, the high signal intensity blood products on T1-weighted sequences, the enhancement, the heterogeneous enhancement post-contrast, as well as restricted diffusion looking at the diffusion-weighted image and the corresponding ADC map. So where does that leave us? Well, maybe if the prevalence really is 1 in 352, maybe we need a, register of, a registry of sarcomas. Do we need an imaging lexicon, dare I say, FIRADS? Um, and is there a need for a large multicenter prospective trial? I'm just putting it out there. I'm not necessarily advocating it. So in conclusion, I think the features of usual garden variety fibroids are well established. 
And we are pretty good at de detecting some leiomyosarcomas if they've read the textbooks and they have some of these imaging features that I've spoken about today. However, there is definite overlap between degenerated fibroids and leiomyosarcomas. And as radiologists, that probably means we should give measured interpretations, especially if those prevalences that the FDA has put forth are true. And I think it really underscores the close collaboration between radiologists, our patients, and our referring clinicians. Thank you very much.